for living in Michigan. Um, it's 5.30. Um, people will filter in over the course of the event, I imagine. So, maybe I'll just say this at the outset. Um, unfortunately, we had a number of cancellations for speakers today, so Chris is going to be kind of just performing uh, a solo, he's going to be doing a solo performance, but I hope that that then means that we have a chance for a more kind of engaged conversation between members of the audience and Chris, and I think that Chris is going to kind of try and modulate or gear his remarks towards just some basic kind of the discussion points that then will be taken up during what's not really going to be Q&A, but more of like discussion period. Um, right, we might leave that practice until give it a, people a few more minutes to filter in other people. Um, I think they were not, they're not invited. Um, so the panel's to this, uh, topic today is art in the commodity form, and I'll begin by reading the description, and maybe I'll say a few words about uh, the sponsoring project. Um, so the abstract for the event this afternoon. If it is true that the commodity structure, uh, referencing Lukács, is the defining feature of modern capitalism down through the present, then it stands to reason that it has no less impacted the way art is produced, consumed, circulated, and exchanged. This shift in art's character happened both objectively, as in an article produced for exchange in the market, and subjectively, that is, as a kind of experience and form of expression for the social and individual body. However, art's relationship to its status as a commodity is an ambivalent one. Art has become, at once, more free from past forms of domination, but its freedom is constrained when subjected to the dynamics of capital. Art as commodity is both a cure, is both its cure and poison, and has become a social problem for its practice. Since becoming aware of this problem, artists, philosophers, curators, and critics have taken various approaches in seeking to overcome it. How has art under cap a capitalist society changed from its pre-capitalist pre practices? What is the commodity form, and what is art's relationship to its logic? Must art seek emancipation from the commodity form, or is it at home in it? In what sense does art take part in the left in emancipatory politics, a practice also seeking to overcome the commodity form, if at all? By asking these questions, this panel seeks to reinvestigate art's relationship to the commodity form and make intelligible how this problematic relationship still sticks with us today. Um, so that's going to be our kind of uh, prompt for discussion today, as well as Chris's presentation. Um, let me just say, in addition, a few words about what Platypus does. Um, we are primarily a student-based organization, although not exclusively uh, compromised of students, comprised of students, rather. Um, but we are based at universities, uh, both domestically in the United States and several cities, as well as internationally in Canada and also in Europe. Um, and we exist to try and host a conversation on the left. And what that means is we try and bring uh, basically different left tendencies and ideologies into uh, a context in which they're kind of asked to speak to each other in ways they wouldn't typically do so. Um, you know, so we'll have people on a panel who will have radically different perspectives, so much so that they would never even have any interaction in their ongoing practices, and ask them to address a topic that is of concern to both of them. Um, and the intent is that we seek to uh, overcome something of the impasse on the left that's uh, generated by its kind of adherence to thought taboos and dogmatisms, um, even if those dogmatisms once had a kind of uh, living vitality and change and under earlier historical circumstances. Um, and so basically our project is uh, an effort to kind of make people aware of the current condition of the left, what we describe as its deadness, um, and also seek after its reconstitution, um, what we say is long live the left. Um, so with that, you know, this is a, art is a part of our, uh, you know, subjects that interest us and, and we try and do events and publish in our publication on the subject and so this is a, a part of that effort. Um, so I guess I'll let Chris take it away. I imagine you're going to have maybe 10 minutes worth of remarks and then... Yeah, I mean, I, I figure I'll uh, kind of improvise it too. I, I kind of made it a circle since uh, there's no presenters besides me, so I figured I'll make a few prompting points. But uh, do people... Are people... Uh, Intimate enough to come closer? Should we get more of a circle so we turn into a conversation? 
I, I noticed there's those back uh, back seats. Hello, I'll even move closer. I don't know for So I did originally start writing a presentation, but uh, I decided that I'll probably just wing it, and I'll just kind of go off the top of my head with some of the ideas that I have and the stuff I wanted to present. And uh, I guess feel free to ask questions and interject any time because we have a lot of time to talk about these things, so it could be more of an organic conversation. Um, so the, the first two questions, there were, there were some, a list of questions that the panelists were meant to answer. The first two were quite basic. What is art? What is the commodity? So maybe I'll try to answer those two questions so we can kind of get our terminology into gear and then see if there's a consensus or a dissensus in the room about how that goes about. Um, in the panel description, it did start with a quote from Lukash, which was from his 1923 book, History and Class Consciousness, about the commodity structure. He has a, a little quote in, on page 83 that I'll just read that defines the commodity structure so we can talk about what that actually entails and how does that condition the production and reception of art um, after the fact. So the commodity structure is what he calls, quote, the problem of commodities must not be considered in isolation or even regarded as a central problem in economics, but as a central structural problem of capitalist society in all its aspects. Only in this case can the structure of commodity relations be made to yield a model of all of the objective forms of bourgeois society together with all the subjective forms corresponding to, to them, end quote. So as we see, the way in which the commodity structure is defined is, is not simply relegated to the field of economics or the economy, the political economy, as a lot of people interpret it as. Lukács sees the commodity structure as a kind of dynamic or a structuring system that defines all of our objective and subjective forms of society. So the commodity structure is expressed in the way we think, the way we uh, conduct things, as well as in the way in which we exchange commodities on the market. Now, in this book, this is kind of a theoretical uh, methodology on what the commodity structure entails. Lukács doesn't necessarily nail down or pinpoint a specific point in history of when the commodity structure became an all-dominating, totalizing force of society. But um, what we can kind of posit is that we start seeing the logic of the commodity structure really taking over um, the historical dynamics around Adam Smith, David Ricardo's time, but it really didn't become a political problem until the Industrial Revolution. Now, this, we, we've seen the uh, discontents and expressions of incipient working class movements, anarchism and mar uh, Marxism, that were responding to capitalism as becoming a global, totalizing phenomenon. Um, so, that may be a controversial statement, but what I'm going to do is kind of take that as my general premise for my argument, is that at some point in history, circa the Industrial Revolution, capitalism, the commodity structure, became a to totalizing effect on the way in which we conduct ourselves in social relations, the way we produce things, and specifically for this topic, the way in which art is produced and received. Now, oh, all right, well, my moderator's coming. Well, I can't text her, so I'll just continue. Um, so, I, what I'm also, the other claim I'm going to make is that art as a practice, as we understand it as modern subjects today, didn't arise until the same time that capitalism became a totalizing force. So even though we have art-like practices uh, as examples of eons of history, like you know we see a lot of virtual objects and objects presented in museums as fine art, the category of art as we practice and understand it did not arise until about the early to mid 19th century. Now, what does that mean necessarily? Um, art, as I take it, is a, as a, is a kind of non-discursive uh, intelligibility of, way of giving form to society. Now, uh, there were certain ways that we understood these practices in, uh, from this kind of sensibility as opposed to the past. For instance, as I said, ritual objects. These objects that were used um, in prior forms of society weren't meant for a kind of disinterested contemplation or a way of expressing uh, uh, how we uh, experience society and stuff like that. They were actually attached as like what you know has been called magical fetish objects sometimes and stuff like that. Other in other cases, like in Greek society, they were used um, for kind of moral instruction, political instruction. So these art forms actually had a kind of status to them. They acted as a crutch for uh, to get a point across, or they acted as uh, what's the word? Um, 
they acted they, they acted as a Oh, what's the word for a story that's supposed to give you an immoral instruction? An allegory. And not an allegory. Uh, uh, it starts parable. with a D. It starts with a D. A parable. A parable. Didactic. It's kind of didactic, like <laughs> as if it were teaching a lesson. It'll come to me later. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, art, as it's been practiced for the past 200 years, is a fairly new phenomenon. So basically, if art arose at the same time that the commodity structure became a, to uh, a totalizing force on society, then what I want to argue is that art, from its very inception and the way in which it's practiced, is always already a commodity. Now, this myth is contra to a lot of uh, a lot of the discourses that we read or the things that we hear about, like where a lot of arguments we hear is that oh well, art is made freewheeling and then it becomes commodified and thus it poisons art. And so when art becomes a commodity and a lot of these arguments that we hear is when it's no longer art. But what I want to argue is that the commodity form is actually part and parcel of the logic behind the mode of producing and making art and then receiving it. Now, that's not to say that, um, it's, that art is reduced to a commodity. The main question that comes after that is, is art, can art become more than a commodity? And is, is there something about the experience and production of art that uh, says something more than it just being an article of exchange, right? Being reduced to its exchange value, as people call it. Now, am I with people so far? Are people, do they have any questions? Or do we want to turn it to a conversation? Because I just laid out a kind of historical schema and an argument. I have other things to say about what that entails. But do you mean are you clear or do we agree? Am I clear? Do you agree? Do you disagree? I mean, you know, I could babble on and on, but um, since it's just me, I'd rather have this as more of a dynamic thing. But I'll take a pause to see if uh, others want to interject. I'm sort of confused by by uh, the definition of art. Can you go over that? I mean, I'm clear on the timeline. Sure. Do you, do you identify it? Uh, so maybe one what, thing. What, you, what is? One thing I should be clear about is all right, so the difference maybe between pre-modern or pre-capitalist forms of art and other. A lot of what you uh, people start to understand art practice to be um, since the capitalist era is that art became autonomous. Now, what does that mean? Art became, it was no longer a vestige to the patronage system, it became subject to the marketplace. And also, art uh, wasn't dictated by laws from the church or by the government. I mean, you see, uh, people used to do apprenticeship practices as artists, where they would, um, or a patron would say, I want you to make X, Y, and Z, and then they would have to stay true to the patron. Now, around the 1700s, you see this transformation where artists, um, like with, uh, well, there's two different ways we can talk about it, but one is that artists start individually creating works on their own, from their own internal expression, as the uh, ideology was formed, and they start, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't wedded to the ideas of the patron or what the patron wanted to do, so all of a sudden artists became more of a self-expression of like how they experienced you know, uh, their social reality and stuff like that. Um, and also, another interesting shift that we see is in Dutch landscape paintings. Before in apprenticeship programs, painting was done case by case basis. There would be a patron or someone that would commission an artwork and it would be produced. But then with uh, it's strange, when art started entering the marketplace, people started actually painting uh, paintings wholesale. And they would start, set, so they would paint paintings in advance and then go to like, these Sunday fairs and sell them, right? So that was a, there was a big transformation in practice as well. I mean, one can see the logic of the commodity already there, where they started producing in advance. Did you have something to say? Well, just, I mean, I guess, you know, the question is, can one identify like moments that then become the kind of primary, um, you know, feature of, of art and modernity that are present in an earlier moment? And also, you know, maybe there's also a distinction that could be, you know, uh, discussed between like the rise of modernity and modern like kind of relations to art and the rise of capitalism, especially like, you know, kind of pre-industrial capitalism and later post-industrial capitalism, like there's a number of different turning points in that history, um, you know, because arguably like the rise of modernity would you know, be completely synchronous with the rise of capitalism and certainly would predate industrial capitalism, which you're using with your market. So I wonder if you can kind of speak to those different markers and turning points and how they relate to it. Well, there's um, the, the idea of social realism, or like realism coming about around 1830s, right? And that was also, I mean, that's like when modernity in, in art history is typically understood to have arisen. 
Did you have something to say about the chart? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, wait till you finish. So, I mean, you know, I'm, I guess I'm taking, like, I think the Industrial Revolution was quite a big turning point. It's, there's one art historian that I find quite interesting that talks about what he, in a book called The Invention of Art. His name is Larry Scheiner. And his, he's the main scaffold behind my interpretation of the history of art. And he said it wasn't until 1830, until the modern definition of art as like an autonomous practice, call it, didn't necessarily arise, you know, fully flowered. He sees precursors of that moment happening in the like, late 1600s, but he develops various stages, which I won't get into because I'll have to look through my notes again in order to act, accurately portray it. Yeah, I, I guess like, like I, I, my impulse here is to be somewhat contrary. And I guess like the first question I have is sort of the definition, the, the assumption of a commodification or the art is a commodity. Because I think that the idea of commodity production, generalized commodity production in modern capital obviously permeates all aspects of society, including art. But I don't think that art really, in a literal sense, is a commodity, the way most commodities are commodities. What people mean by this is artists produce works of art and they're sold on the market, rather than artists basically working for a paper. In other words, it's the way, so that what, what that really makes an artist is a, is a, except for the ideology of art is a kind of small time craft producer because like like you don't like part of the ideology of art is that art is not mass produced generally on an industrial scale. Usually if you mass produce something on an industrial scale, people say, well that's not art. It's like some object, right? Like even if you think the iPhone is beautiful, people don't normally think of an iPhone as a work of art because it seemed and, and even if it didn't have the utilitarian purpose. So I think that that the way manufactured things are produced is sort of maybe what changes. But I don't. I think that the, the, the talk about the commodification of art is itself part of the problem. And I guess like the time scale you mentioned, like about the 19th century, I mean, I find that problematic because I think that you're really talking about three or more different stages, or maybe more. You're talking about pre-moderns like medieval, where the artist is an anonymous craftsman. So somebody sculpts a beautiful Gothic sculpture on a cathedral, but is basically just a nameless craftsman. And then you talk about the Renaissance, where these people, where you have an ideology of the artist as a genius who's created, which is part of the modern ideology of art. And I don't think that's a product of, that might be a product of kind of bourgeois subjectivity. But I think it's something that certainly predates the Industrial Revolution. And then you have like what it seems to me is like this modern sense of art as a crisis, which is like the sense that art represents the crisis of art. And I mean, of course, you can define art however you want, but like one of the aspects of like the present conception of art is its retroactivity, right? So that we now go and we see like art like paintings from the upper Paleolithic, and we can appropriate that to our conception of that as being a kind of art. Well, we can. And that's we, a kind of projection, would you agree? It's a projection. Obviously, it's a projection because the people who did this clearly had no conception of art. So there's a way in which that backward conception is itself paradoxically part of like that disintegration and crisis moment of art. So I think like we, like, like the sense of like, okay, art was invented with the Industrial Revolution, that, that seems to me to conflate like several things. I could go into that more. Let's take okay. some more. Okay. Well, also, in a much more a later time, there are artists who, I mean, there's a book called The Fall, the Elite Object, taking the art out of the conventional uh, realm of the gallery or something. So for example, Jeff Koons, um, we'll put a vacuum cleaner there and say art is a commodity. Um, so it's sort of like sat a satire of um, trying to make, trying to take art out of the context of this is an aesthetic object and deliberately using an ordinary thing, putting in the glass case and saying this, and it's actually a vacuum cleaner. And he also takes art as kitsch, um, 
to deliberately lampoon the aesthetic. Uh, in other words, modernism uh, idea was that the creation of it, the actual brush strokes or whatever, that that aesthetic quality, taking that away from it and, and making art uh, as a satire of art as a commodity, that's kind of a twist of the screws, or more or less. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I would actually take some issue with what Richard said about the idea of the work of art as inherently unique and non-reproducible. Because, I mean, certainly within certain avant-garde movements of the 20th century, Bauhaus, Russian constructivism, etc., the whole idea was that you could create standardizable objects that, albeit when, when put on exhibition, would be singular, like they'd be just single works exhibited. But the idea was that they could be industrially mass produced, and there was still an artistic dimension to their design, or their, their prefabricated quality. But the broader question that I have is, I mean, you lay out this, this chronology and this story of the rise of art, and why, why art has a sort of beginning, historically. Um, and it, you relate it, in some sense, to the, the sort of social uh, context in which it was emerging. My question would be, is there a sort of narrative arc to art's development from its, its rise? If art has a beginning, does it also have an end? And if so, why would it end? What would that mean? How would it relate to, to the sort of changes in society that, I mean, presumably also uh, shaped the beginning of art? What, how, how would those changes shape the end of art? Well, I'll, I guess I'll respond to Richard's thing with how I see it, and why I think it as, let's see, art um, as kind of arising during the 19th, mid 19th century. And that I, think, I don't think that. Richard's uh, idea that art is meant to be a unique experience or a unique object or process is necessarily wrong. On the other hand, I don't think that standardizing the production of art like in a Warhol-esque or a Coons way is necessarily wrong too. But nonetheless, we still treat a Warhol or a Coons as some kind of unique process or object. There's something that we are beholden to with that object as opposed to just looking at a vacuum cleaner in a store. Something about the way in which Coons elevates these commodities is meant to be more than just experiencing widgets all you know everywhere. Where and it, and it affects the, the, the economic value. Exactly. Which it wouldn't if it were just a regular commodity. The whole point of regular commodities is that so, lots of them. Um, what, we, what I want to say is that the, the ideology that Richard was uh, speaking about, about the uniqueness of a work of art, did not. I, I would argue, did not really arise until the time period that I said. And that is a response to the logic of commodities. Now, maybe we should get to the bare, the brass tacks of what a commodity is. And most people refer to it as uh, um, commodities as a, a social process where one object could be traded for another object. It, well, ob objects of unequal value become equalized by their exchange value. So the use value, you know, the use value versus the exchange value divide that we commonly hear about, exchange value takes privacy over its use value. And then we, then, then why, is, why the commodity structure becomes a totalizing force is when that kind of system is, dominates the way in which we uh, produce, exchange, circulate, consume goods. Now, I would say that art, uh, the idea of art being a unique object arose out of that kind of condition. So, you know, even if, and that's why I would say it's part of the logic, it may be contra, uh, tr I'm trying to pitch itself against it, but it's in response to that kind of social shift. And art is meant to, is people sometimes describe art as non-fungible, meaning that it can't be ex the experience that one has of an art object, or the way in which they produce this object, cannot be traded, or cannot be exchanged for any other experience. This is why it's unique. Now, I mean, some, a lot of artists or a lot of people have tried to say this is not the case, this is something we can debate. But I think that um, that kind of ideology of treating art and, and producing it arose at the same time. 
we'll take a question from the back. I think it seems, I mean, it seems to me that this issue, commodity form really relates, and I, and I do think that this gets into the issues of periodization mm -hmm. um, in terms of the rise of bourgeois society as distinct from capital. Um, in as much as we're talking about the commodification of labor and the ability to sell oneself uh, in the uh, fundamental affinity, right, of not only producing, not only work, not working for a patron, not producing for a patron, but not working for a master, mm -hmm. right, um, but one of self of self emancipation in society, right, that you are going to work for wages, not for a master, right? not for your traditional lord. Right? And this is the great revolution, of course, in, in the history of, of our species, at least since the emergence of class society itself. Um, and that issue of human freedom relates to the capacity for individual experience. Right. And that's where I think the question of art as crisis arises, right? But the issue is, it's not just this fungibility, because things were equalized in markets long before bourgeois society, right? Markets equalize things. They equalize things in relation to money. That's what markets do. That happened in ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. um, you know, anywhere where there's money exchange, market exchange in the, in the agora of Athens, there's an exchange of goods and an equalization of goods, and Aristotle remarks upon it. Um, it seems to me that the issue is the relationship of the commodification of labor to issues of freedom, and therefore the possibility of an experience that can, in relation to which, we can transform ourselves, right? Uh, that that, that an experience can be something from which human beings develop, that this is related, related to, the, to the project of individuality. And this is there in, in Milton, in Defoe, in bourgeois art, right? Meditation on the, question, on the question of our experience itself and its potential universality, right? Um, and so I guess I'm, you know, we want to specify this issue of the commodity form as in under capital, right, as a crisis of human freedom in the relationship of art to that. And within that, the continuing attempt of humanity necessarily to emancipate itself in the form of wage labor, right? That we continue to, in a sense, to be bourgeois or to try to be bourgeois to try to be free and free from direct domination in a context within which that self-undermining. And then I think that that's what Marx means by the condition of capital. And that, so that art continues to be bourgeois. We still write buildings Roman that predate, this is an art form that, that predates capital, right? This is a bourgeois form, uh, and yet it, itself registers it to the extent that the Bildung's Roman form has, has survived as vital. It registers a, a crisis within the form itself. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm, I mean, listening to Spencer maybe kind of have some reflection upon like the specificity of the mid 19th century is like the emergence of art. And perhaps what's at issue there is uh, the kind of insistence or claim made by art to its own autonomy, to its own separation, in fact, from what appeared to be the crisis of freedom in society that was represented and produced by the, you know, uh, kind of, essentially the kind of way in which industrial labor undermined the freedom of people to actually exchange equivalents when they exchange the labor on the market, right? That in some fundamental way, the you know, rise of industrial society meant that there was a kind of 
the intensification of the exploitation of labor under conditions of exchange of labor. And so it seems that perhaps what's occurring is that, you know, while art, you know, dissociated itself from the institutions of pre-modern traditional relations, you know, the church and, and state and the patronage system, and adopted or, you know, uh, took onto itself a kind of sense of its own humanity separated from those things, you know, I mean, like the artists of the of the Enlightenment were also the scientists of the Enlightenment, were also the like political, you know, authors of the political tracts of the Enlightenment, and so forth, right? I mean, they didn't recognize the distinction of like an exclusively art-producing practice. They rather saw themselves as humanists, of which art practice was a part, and perhaps some of them were better than others. But nevertheless, that was a kind of unified. Uh, you know, sensibility, whereas in the 19th century it seems like it's precisely in the attempt to say, no, we don't want any truck with the crisis of society, that art actually becomes its own object, but in so doing actually, you know, then becomes a symptom of society in a way that prior to it hadn't exactly had that same quality of both being different and distinct, but also being like profoundly representative of that crisis. I don't know, just, it made me think about like why the 19th century, why the Industrial Revolution, like what, you know, because I, I have a problem with thinking of it as thinking that, okay, well, you know, every development in, the, you know, material relations of society thereby produces an equivalent development in the aesthetic comportment of people's, you know, of, uh, you know, lives. It just seems like that can be too, like, causal or something, but this maybe is a way of trying to articulate it within that same historical kind of narrative that doesn't rely on that same kind of causality. There's others in the room. I could respond to this. Yeah, please. I mean, in, in relation to this, we would get more fine grained in relation to the epoch of capital. Mm -hmm. Right, to that there would be an issue, not only, in a sense, the industrial revolution, so in some sense, viewed in material terms, but the Industrial Revolution is itself a project of human freedom, right? The Industrial Revolution as as, as really being driven by the working class. Um, and how that freedom becomes unmastered, right, in the 20th century uh, as, as a context for transformations in the crisis of art. Right? So that the issue of art as a crisis from arguably 1848 to 1917 might, be, might look very different in the 1920s, 30s, and beyond. Uh, and, 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 and there, really, the, the question is, it is the way in which the self, the, the way in which the commodity form comes to disintegrate, right, in the context of unmastered freedom, right? the question of social disintegration uh, of, of capital uh, in, in in the 20th century. Ross? Okay, yeah. Um, in fact, th with that periodization of 1848 to 1917, or if one would want to date it earlier to 1830, I think you mentioned this, what many art historians agree on is the beginning of um, art in its modern sense. I'm wondering, I mean, the sort of crisis of 19th century society, um, in which the bourgeois project of freedom was thrown into question radically by the Industrial Revolution, where the question of, of history and any sort of meaning in history began to be posed seriously as, you know, does, does society have a sort of directionality? Is it going somewhere? Marxism, you know, in, in one interpretation, Louis Menon uh, writes about it in this way that you know, Marxism was significant in the sense that it, it gave a sort of meaning, a logic, to historical development. I guess my question would be, paralleling the crisis in, in modern society with the Industrial Revolution, there seemed to be a, a, a crisis in art. Again, I'm not positing it as something causal strictly uh, that Ben um, alluded to, some, some have explained it that way. But I'm wondering if there, I mean, many have remarked that from 1830, 1848 to 1917, perhaps a bit afterwards, 
there seemed to be a sort of inherent unfolding logic or direction to artistic development. I mean, there were counter, in any given period, there were countervailing tendencies. There were uh, artistic schools that were in radical opposition to one another. But there still seemed to be sort of underlying principles according to which artistic practice unfolded. There seemed, art seemed to be heading somewhere. I'm, what I'm wondering is, after, in that, after the sort of dissolution of the avant-garde, does, did art, did history cease to have the kind of meaningfulness that it once possessed? Is it clear where art is going today, or is it just sort of spinning its wheels in this sort of empty vacuum of you know, trying to determine its own meaningfulness, uh, its place in society, you know, in the same sense that politics seems to be spinning its wheels, uh, unsure of you know, what role you know, society can, can what, what different parts of society can actually do to transform the world in which they live. I'm wondering if there's any sort of like parallel in these periodizations between um, between the disintegration of meaning in history, the disintegration of a sort of unfolding logic to artistic practice, um, and if if in, 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 a, in any way they are related, unconsciously, directly, indirectly, however. Well, there's been several movements that I'm aware of, like that seek to say, well, you know, art has been relegated to this wide field. It's kind of uh, built its own trajectory. So what we need to do is introduce art to life and help emancipate people from uh, living in uh, an unrefined world. Art, so if we bring art into the world, uh, you know, the, the, the art in the everyday is it's called like through fluxes or something like that. The idea would be that it would help people gain freedom. Now, I think that this also speaks to the idea of crisis that Spencer and Richard were speaking to in the sense that in many cases, we do have art surrounding us all around the world, but are we any more free because of it? Does art can art play that role? So then it becomes the question, becomes a political question, is that is it, is it the role of art to allow, uh, to give people that kind of freedom, or th does there have to be also a political project in order to bring them forth that freedom as well? I'm not sure if I quite understood your question. Or well, I mean, answer. I'm guessing, like, if, if there is this political problem of the ability of humanity to change the world in which it lives, to, tra to, sort of, to make history rather than something be made by history. Is there, I mean, can, can you have a sort of logical development or meaning direction in, his, in art and artistic practice? Can, can art seem to be moving forward in the same sense that history seems seem to be moving forward? And once, once that sort of, that, that meaning or, or logic of development of of humanity's ability to change the world in which it lives on a conscious basis. Once that collapsed, I'm wondering if the ability for art to move forward also collapsed. Because I mean, art, at least in a, a formal sense, is about reshaping the objects of nature according to you know the conscious aims of, of humanity. In that very abstract sense, it is distantly related conceptually to, to politics. I mean, again, how these things relate to one another uh, is is complicated. But I mean, I'm wondering if there's any relationship between the two. Uh, Richard. Well, I mean, I guess I'm sort of puzzled by the terms of discussion and sort of the implicit acceptance of sort of a politicization. I mean, I, I think I, I always, when I hear people talk about politics and art, think that there's a sort of delusional quality that, that obviously art cannot bear the burden of transforming the world in the way that politics needs to. And that that to ask that of art is to misjudge its role. Like what seems to me the problem nowadays or the problem that's been going on for a very long time is the crisis of representation, not just an external representation of object, but so to speak of social and representation of creating art that seems um, to speak to the social reality that we live in. And it seems to me that the sort of last art that might have had a claim to that was modernism. And that sort of the crisis of postmodernism is the sense we don't have an art that even represents our sense of disintegration. 
And mm -hmm. I guess like what bothers I mean, I don't really care how one defines art, although I actually would tend to sort of define art in a more traditional narrative and sort of not push it back a lot farther. But I guess sort of my, my thought in this narrative is sort of that, that you have sort of the modern conception of art and you have this sort of pre-modern traditional. And yet, if you sort of go to a museum or read a kind of standard art history, one of the periods that is held up as sort of um, you know the high point of art, and certainly would have been 100 years ago, is the Renaissance. If you go to the Met, for example, the, there's a whole section marked off, specifically. There are two whole sections that are marked off. There is Western art from 1250 to 1800 or so. And then there's like 19th century art, and then there's the 20th century art. In other words, there's like art which represents some type of bourgeois sensibility, I would argue, but is before the crisis that Chris is talking about. And then there's the art of the 19th century, which is essentially the narrative of the beginning of the crisis of art. Mm -hmm. But sort of how, with this narrative, of art is invented with this crisis of commodification, industrial revolution, how do you understand that whole category of you know, 70 rooms or so in the net that are presented as this is five centuries of Western art from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment? Like what is where does that fit into the narrative? Because that doesn't like like that isn't art fully as quote the commodity for the market, but it's clearly art that speaks to some type of bourgeois proto bourgeois sensibility that's very different from some sort of craftsman of a Gothic cathedral or sculptor. That was the first separation between art and craft during the Renaissance era. Okay, but, 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 but so in that sense, isn't that the sort of introduction of some kind of bourgeois consciousness that then, with the Industrial Revolution, enters into some kind of crisis? I mean, isn't that the, the heroic narrative of art that you begin to have with Vasari, of the artist of Jesus? Isn't that the sort of sense? I mean, I mean isn't that why that art? sort of before modernism up to modernism speaks to the modern sensibility as something that is recognized as an anticipation. I mean, I mean that, that's where sort of the 1848 and after the trajectory of modernism narrative about art, because I think that... What I was trying to say is that I can interrupt. I mean, this is trying to point to the fact that we are still bourgeois, or we still try to be bourgeois. Um, you know, young people are educated into an aesthetic sensibility by reading classics of bourgeois literature. You know, they're not introduced okay. to, to art by reading Kafka. Uh, they're introduced by, by reading works from the 18th and 19th centuries. Right? Um, you know, what, what is the development of uh, an individual subjectivity. I, told, I imagine 14 year olds still read David Copperfield. Um, you know that that these are these are th these are ways in which we still try to live. Right? Uh, we still try to be able to narrate our own lives. Uh, we still try to say within all of this contingency. Right, there is a stable subject developing. Um, you know, I think that in, in that sense, uh, you know, the bourgeois persists in the age of capital. One thing I was going to also want to raise in terms of this issue of reproducibility, it does seem to me that you know more than just the issue of like can art be reproduced or not is the question of the way in which the reproducibility of art coincided with, in a sense, the, the collapse of human freedom. You know, I think this is a very Dornian kind of question. Right? How Beethoven was liberated to the masses and played on the radio in the age of fascism. Right? The way in which 
are color reproducibility of film, color magazines, color plates, mass reproducibility of images coincided with, you know, that in, in some sense, the uh, democratization of aesthetic experience coincided with the, in a sense, universal collapse of, 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 of politics in, 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 in the 20th century. Uh, and that the form in which that disintegration of society, the form that that disintegration of society took was as a kind of dystopian negative image of emancipation, right? That the operation of the market was suspended and we're gonna have a welfare state, we're gonna have a national community and we're going to have you know, the, the most, you know, the, the best artists in the world NBC studios play Beethoven better than the bourgeoisie ever heard it. Um, and you're going to have it played on your speakers and your headphones better than it sounds in the music hall, uh, so forth and so on. That, you know, that, that the saturation of our experience with art coincided with the total liquidation of individuality in the 20th century. Um, in, in in that sense, and so it, it seems to me that this issue is, you know, this question of the potential democratization, you know, that mass reproducibility is connected to an issue of democracy uh, and, and the way in which um, 20th century mass democracy as, un as the generalization of untruth uh, is, is related to a, a, a simultaneous asceticization total satisfaction of our experience and the liquidation of things as the possibility of experience. But that kind of Adornian problem that uh, is, is integral to, to certainly to the modernist uh, problem. Of the unique experience yeah. that you're speaking to? Yeah. You know, the, so the, this is, but that's the significance of, of talking about the call, you know, 1917, something like that. The, the collapse of, of, of socialism in the way of, 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 of the defeats of the Bolshevik Revolution, of the defeats of Marxism. And it's interesting the way that people have unique experiences now because even though that everyone knows what the Mona Lisa looks like, people will flood to France to see the Mona Lisa. And in, 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 a, in a kind of paradoxical way, we almost give uh, much more weight to the unique experience of the original, despite the fact that the original has been saturated by mass production. It, it's yeah, funny, just like you talk about. It's funny. It's funny you said that because that I think just as he was speaking, I had an image. I was actually recently in France and saw them at least, and of course, you don't see them on the whole thing. And there's this more of people all snapping picture. <laughs> And what's fascinating is a lot of people are taking pictures of people or having pictures of themselves taking pictures of the Mona Lisa. <laughs> it's just become like this common representation of this experience. Yeah. Is that just a way of saying that Jeff Koons is a crappy artist or Jeff 
<laughs> but I mean, that's like a difference. Like, yeah, no, I know. Point. We're saying it's good bad versus it's is or is not. Yeah, but no, I know. So that was that was. There's a lot of different yeah. things. You can't just lump it all Jeff can just blanket like that. There's some things that <laughs> more like that than others. And others. I think right. what yeah. she's saying is that it takes a lot of people to make a Jeff Koons. Like he, his work is made on the secondary market. I mean, no, really, like what more I meant. I mean, that was that was a sort of a bad joke, and I think there are way more uh, interesting people to to talk about than maybe Jeff Koons. Well, I mean, I said that because. He deliberately deals with art as a commodity, which is the topic of this. That's it's one, twist, one twist of it. We'll, we'll deal with one question at a time. Right. Um, so, I, yeah, I guess my, my, um, my question is like, why are we talking about this now? I'm sorry I came in late. What is the this? Uh, art and commodity. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, maybe the, maybe the this is the long history, like the question of when does art become art, and how does that correspond to the rise of like yeah. commodity society, commodity you know, Can we society. talk about art from 1830 in the same way that we talk about art from now, or you know, 1990s? Jeff Koons was in the 80s. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, it's a presentation. Oh, there was not much of it since it was just me. I tried to turn it into. Um, I'll, I'll let Ben re respond and then I'll, I'll try to respond. Well, there are also a lot of artists who revert, like Malmwood or something, go, go back to social realism and but give it a certain twist that's not the same as it was previously. You know, but you can still call it social realism vaguely. You know, so I mean, it's, these movements re repeat themselves but in different ways as time goes on. I wanted to, you know, try and uh, at least start you know answering the question of like why is this conversation relevant today by just reference to the way that the relationship between art and commodities and like the, what the word commodity means when it's often you know used in the context of a discussion of art uh, has come to be today like how that conversation is shaped and, and what its kind of content is today because it seems to me I mean you know I, I work in the art world but not as a art producer but as like a installer I'm a manual labor in the art world, <laughs> you know, an actual workout in the art world. Um, but the you know experience of that is certainly one of like you know bearing witness to the you know sale of art, right? I mean, I work in a gallery, and that's the whole thing. It's like all predicated on the sale of art. And I go to the art fairs, and I like witness the kind of you know uh, mall feel to like the sale of art, you know, and and so forth. And so I think in light of you know especially since the kind of mid-century, the like rapid expansion of art as a kind of commodity to be purchased for investment purposes um, and its extension, you know, into this world of like high-end kind of luxury goods, which it always has been, but perhaps it's taken on a more emphatic kind of coloration in that, in that way uh, in the past 40 years or so, that the notion of art as a commodity is kind of returned as a kind of like pejorative, like well, what's wrong with the art world is that art is a commodity, and like, what's wrong with artists is that they're trying to produce art. I mean, like my, you know, best friends who are like finally making some money on their art are like so obsessed with the fact that they're finally making some money on art that like they like get into these, they attempt to get into these arguments with me. They're like, well, I'm a capitalist, so I don't understand why you're a socialist because I employ one artist assistant in my studio and like produce art for the market, and I'm happy about it because it's paying me to like pay my student loans back and all this kind of shit, you know. And so, like, you know, there's this kind of apparent, like, degradation of the work of art when it's commodified. But I think that the reason why the conversation here is, like, tilted towards, like, you know, what may seem to be, like, an arcane question of, like, art and the emergence of modern society and which was subjectivity and, like, the transformations and all this has to do with the maybe once held or at least somewhat perceived notion that even if the commodity form is a problematic in society, it's also the basis of subjectivity and freedom to the extent to which freedom exists in society, even if in contradictory ways. The commodity form expresses the contradiction of freedom in modern society, right? And so the question is, you know, to go to something that Richard said, like I don't, you know, he doesn't like how art is treated as like somehow a political tool to be wielded by like, you know, the now cultured masses or something like that, right? And it's like, well, the point is never that art is a good implement to be used in any kind of political struggle so much as art tells us about the subjects who would then have to make the revolution because what subjects appreciate what kind of art, you know? 
peasants appreciated a particular kind of art. They liked the story of you know the redemption of of Christ or whatever in stained glass windows. We don't like that as much. You know, my fiance can't deal with Handel's Messiah because it reminds her of church and she prefers something else. You know, and so it's like, I think that the idea is that as subjectivity changes, so does the art that like corresponds to the appreciation in the present. <laughs> That's a nice performance. Um, and so the, I think the question is, you know, do we still live under the same kind of contradictory conditions of freedom that define our subjectivity? And does that, what does that then say about our relationship to the commodity form as it stands today? Or you know, has that fundamentally changed in the past 20 years? And what would it mean to make the argument that in the past 20 years, like the commodity is now no longer the basis of potential freedom, even if it's in contradictory ways, but is now just the evil that ought to be avoided. And art is the only refuge of the non-commodified. Right? I mean, that's the problematic, I think, that, you know, is expressed in the shift in discourse over the past 20 years. I mean, I don't know what I would think about that, but... I want to... Yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, just to relate directly to the topic of the panel, I mean, how does... How does it affect art once art and art artists, those who practice artistic discourse, um, begin to try and conceptualize the problem of art as a commodity. I, I think that it has taken different forms in different times. Um, what Ben just alluded to about the commodity being a sort of potential uh, analog or uh, reflection of the contradictions and freedom of freedom in society um, and something that bears a sort of potential versus this sort of like evil that must be avoided. You know, my art is not, you know, for sale. It's not to just make money. I mean, how is the conceptualization of commodification within artistic practice, uh, how does that affect art in, in today and for the past you know, however many years? I think that the, the conversation actually kind of sways towards something that we didn't talk about very much, and that, and that was the idea of the commodity form, that we're giving form to the commodity. And art, in a way, is allow allows that ability for that kind of expression. So what we didn't really talk much about earlier was what would it mean to say that the commodity structure is also a way of um, how, how, how that affects subjectivity. And I think that that's what art gets into, is that art is a, a way of expressing the contradictory world that we're living in, where we, that Spencer is talking about with them. Um, you know, this yearning for freedom uh, through our uh, bourgeois forms of life, but we keep, we, we keep up, it's a, it becomes in crisis, we're not achieving it yet, we're yearning for it. And there's this one essay that I wanted to bring up in the conversation, but I was hoping it would be brought up organically, which it kind of did, is this, this writer from the turn of the 20th century, Siegfried Krakauer, who wrote this great essay called The Mass Ornament. And he, call, and he's, he went, instead of evaluating art, and he has these like little quips about art. What he wrote? Yeah, The Mass Ornament, yes. And he, he's actually analyzing culture. Now, I'll, I'll get into it a little bit, like why, is, you know, is it important to like talk about art in a different way than we just talk about like mass popular culture, which is another discussion we could have. But he says that there's, um, that he talks about this group called the Tiller Girls, which I'll, I'll put on display right now, and then kind of talk over it. But um, he basically says that there's, that it, there, it's, he calls it an aesthetic reflex. That with the, tiller, the dancing of the Tiller girls, which you're about to witness, is an aesthetic reflex of the social conditions in which they live under. And he refers it to factory manual labor, repetitive tasks on conveyor belt, specialization, loss of individuality, how they all move in sync. So why is the Tiller girls important to Krakauer? And he says that this is an unconscious aesthetic reflex of the conditions that people subject themselves to in their daily existence of capitalism. And now he's, 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 so then he starts pondering, why is it that the masses come and see this and take pleasure in what they're experiencing? And he said, well, it's because they're repeating what their movements in their daily life. Now, a lot of people will you know, still say, well, this is kitsch, this is bad culture. But Krakauer says, what he calls it a legitimate. He's like, the pleasure that people take in this is legitimate. And this is the expression of the commodity form right here. Now, would, now, is it important to talk about art versus like popular culture? If one could glean like some kind of fundamental truth in the social reality that we would all take part in creating, 
and the kind of the, the, the drudgery of the commodity form, what have you. And is art can art do it any better? Is art somehow more able to bring the uh, conscious reflection uh, of you know like their existence? Is this just repeating? Like, is, are the Taylor girls just repeating uncritically what we just you know are stuck with doing every day? Or is there is can one can have a critical ex experience from this? I'll, I'll just say this before I'll take um, take a question: Is that you know the, the argument, which may be just a pure ideology, is that art somehow is able to consciously allow people to reflect on their conditions in a more critical way than just pure popular culture. I'm not going to say if I agree or disagree. I'm just going to say that that's been an argument that's been offered that high art, avant-garde art, is able to somehow get people to think deeper about these problems than popular culture such as that. But nonetheless, one could glean these kind of truths in popular culture. Yes. You know, but see, the thing is this, that what's, what's distinct about art as opposed to this repetitive movement or something that you think that people, uh, um, repeat their own experience or something like that, is formal elements. I mean, that's a modernist argument, but it's, um, if you, I mean, I'm an artist and also an art historian, but I, I mean, when you, um, to, to, if you say take, take a, a, a realistic painting or something from the Renaissance, then you, 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 you kind of simplify it in formal elements and show why this is a very interesting solution of space or something like that. And that's the difference um, between, you know, how it's put on the canvas, the space around it, the colors you, et cetera, all those things are formal elements that distinguish it from some repetitive movement in that thing you showed. So, mm -hmm. and then, when the ordinary art people look at things, they may not be aware of this, mm -hmm. but it subconsciously maybe, um, you know, if they see a, a picture by Van Gogh or something, you know, they. They may not understand the, the formal elements or, what, or, or or color color balances or whatever, but they feel some certain pleasure from that. That's different from seeing some repetitive element or something. You know? So it's a, it's the formal elements that distinguish it from this kind of thing you showed. There. I, 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 um, I'll just say something and open it up afterwards. I, I, I catch on what you're saying, but I think that. The other argument, which I think um, is an interesting way of looking at it, is that the Tiller Girls um, was is overtly meant as a form of entertainment. People have their nine to five day, then they go and see the Tiller Girls as a leisure time, which is bound to the very logic of capitalism. Right? It's not like they are free for that that momentary part of their lives to unwind and and enjoy the Tiller Girls. Now, art artists in, in a lot of the art world try to make the argument that what they produce is not just for mere entertainment, but it's meant to be compelling. It's meant to drive people to think about it. Whereas the Tiller Girls is just meant to alleviate to momentarily. Now, we're in a very bad predicament these days because the way in which people view and experience art is really not all that separate from the way in which we view and experience entertainment. They're intertwined so much now that one, it's art, you know, can we even say that art offers a, a, a more compelling experience or can be more self-conscious than entertainment? That I will also leave as an open question. Uh, I, I just have to say this. I mean, can't you even, in a parenthetical, say that what you're seeing there, yes, it's repetitive, etc., it's entertainment versus art, blah, 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 but what is that body parts of women on display, that's why people find it entertaining, is because it reinforces the, you know, the dominant, you know, paradigm of, you know, the subjugation of half of humanity in the, you know. Uh, what are you thinking of? Okay, I'm just wondering, just, I don't know, this are supposed to be Marcus here, that you wouldn't yeah. even mention that as an aspect of this, just even as a parenthetical, it just like blows my mind, that's all. Okay. I mean, you, why? Well, you know, I mean, I, I'm not going to really get into the sex. I mean, one could like make, a, make a, a, an argument. It's not a feminist argument. It's a human argument. Well, I didn't say feminist. But I, I'm, what I'm saying is that one can make the argument that there is a, a, a certain way of objectifying females sexually in that. But Krakauer actually makes an interesting 
interesting point in the essay of how he calls it sexless bodies. And he's, his argument is that it isn't about the, sexu the sexualization of the women because it's more about these uh, body parts movement that are detached from the actual subjects. That they're all morphed together in such a way that their individuality as women, and it's just more about the body parts flailing, little parts of it. Now, you could agree or disagree, I would suggest reading the essay, but I mean, I'm just saying, my- Well, go to the Rockettes, I mean, see what the reaction is in the eyes. The Rockettes are, quite, quite, are an obvious adaptation of this form of line dance. But 19th century ballet choruses could also be analyzed like that without industrial gesture. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that your point is valid, but I, wanna, uh, I do want to actually keep it parenthetical because I would like to talk more about the experience of the commodity relations and, and its relation to art or culture. But I, I do think that your point, that there's a long, long discussion we could have about that. We have a question on the mic. Yeah, um, not so much a question, but like a lot of questions <laughs> that I've opened up to the whole room. Um, just in terms of like my background, I just did a thesis on like dance and postmodern dance and dance theaters stemming from the Judson Dance Company and Trisha Brown into the present, kind of tracing the transition between modernism and postmodernism in the dance world. And so for me, um, when I think about Trisha Brown, I think of the commodity and art, definitely, because her or their as dancers lack of the funds to go into private spaces with their art or to be funded in those private spaces kind of opened up the necessity to go outside and use my specific work and to be kind of creating this disconnect between a greater modified form, I guess. So some questions that came up for me from that, and you were mentioning some things that were making me think of Fukuyama, Francis Fukuyama's The End of History, mm -hmm. his asking, <laughs> Is asking like, are we at this place where like history doesn't exist anymore? Has it ended? And so my question from that is like, is art coming to a place where it all is like has to be a, a collaboration in a way? And is that why we have all of this like multidisciplinary and many different art forms kind of coming together? And if that's true, can we accept this kind of loss of like Renaissance? Prince King style individuality for more of a like globalizing experience of expression? And is the loss of art really a loss of individual ownership over property or like the conceptualization of that? And also, what has the internet done to our ability to experience and own art? Because someone you mentioned, um, I think you mentioned like how you can't really talk about art the same way in the 1980s that you can now. And I feel like that has a lot to do with like. For example, people my age at least are the last generation to remember life before the internet. So I feel like that relates to like the Mona Lisa example of like this experience where you have somebody like taking a picture of the Mona Lisa and being taken like having a picture taken of them and somebody taking a picture of them. Like that's an idea that's been <laughs> Yeah, that's been, that's an idea. That's been coming up a lot for me, like that idea of filming and filming and filming, which I think also plays into like the political sphere of Occupy everything, of everyone kind of having the technology to like document everything and like what does that mean for art? Um, and then quickly in the mass cult popular culture question, I just wanted to bring up the, the idea that like our, the our whole popular culture in the United States is really based in black minstrelsy. So if we are coming to this kind of like post-racial or even potentially like classless society, fate, which is like fundamentally based on ideas of segmentation, then do we need new tools or like structures for how to like express ourselves and how to create art? Um, but I would disagree both with Fukuyama, who I disagree with already, and um, in saying that we are at the end of art or at the end of history and suggest you know, that we are anticipating this kind of new way of doing things that we're in the process of figuring out, which I will conclude by saying um, a, lot of, a lot of the way that I talked about things in my paper was um, through the lens of the interwar period in France and talking about the way that that um, World War I and World War II were, were documented historically, 
which was largely in the hands of historians and school teachers. So if like history up until now was like totally in the hands of historians and school teachers, has the internet shifted that and are we at a different place where there's like a new type of history creating that it will be different but potentially better? And how uh, would that relate to you? your creation art of art and how can we look at France and the Dadaists and those artists of the interwar period as an example? Um, oh, we'll take a question from the back and then Ross and then get your There's a gentleman in the back. Oh. I guess it seems to me that there's, you know, with this issue present in, in recent decades, one of the ways it strikes me is I'm, I'm, a, I'm a reader as I think about literature. Um, the way in which criticism is done in the present. I know for a fact that People my generation can't tell you if a new book is great. They can only tell you the books that were deemed great in the past by past critics. They can tell you that this book is about Latin, you know, this is a, about this identity or that identity, um, but that, I think that this has really become extreme in the, uh, in, with Is there a new author after David Foster Wallace that anyone is going to say, yes, this is this generation? Um, you know, is, there a, is there an art criticism after postmodernism? You know, and since it's a long collapse, the new left of postmodernism. Um, you know, in the present, it seems to me that not, this not only has the function, you know, this can only be seen in criticism, but it can also be seen in literature itself where um, the distinction between popular culture and literature collapses so that you get like novels that have literary pretensions taking being taking on the form of like genre novels, they're crime novels. You know, there's a sort of rediscovery of like the genre novel um, in in this way, so that you know, reading uh, a work of art and reading for entertainment. Um, you know, reading as pop culture versus the reading as art is, is actually collapsing in art production. Uh, in, 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 and I, I would argue really you know, very markedly since the 1990s. Um, you know, I, I guess that that is the, the question, in terms of, to me the issue of like now, like why now, right, is this issue of, you know, the the palpability in the present of the incapacity for critical reflection that you can see you know, really at the level of, of, of social reproduction. Yeah, I, sorry I'm a little late, but I have been, I've been involved in covering cultural uh, issues for 20 years, and I just was at Book Expo last week, so that was like sort of the epitome of uh, creativity being turned into commodity sort of saturated with that for five days. Uh, my question would be, the que you know, you were talking about Krakow. Uh, I'd like to question, you know, how, you know, because I go to academic conferences all the time where people are using the Frankfurt School, Ben Jump with Ben in Krakow. Uh, and, and they're brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But I'm wondering how, uh, how we need perhaps to go to something different or a new synthesis of this as useful as Krakow and Benjamin and the Adorno people are. Because if you go to academic conferences, that's what they're using as models of analysis of art in general, not only literature, but, but film and, and fine art. And I just pose that as a question. You know, like, is that not limiting? Where, why, as brilliant as they are, where are we coming to see things differently now? Because I see positive things going on in the uh, bubbling up below of art in general in our society. I see a lot of good things starting to come up, rebellion coming up. But I just pose that as a question. Um, I want to just address the issue of this idea of the end of art, the sort of 
Fukuyama, end of history, whatever. I think that it's it's been posed multiple times throughout history, I mean, sometimes more significantly than others. But I think that we have to entertain the idea that art can end or or die or, or however you want to phrase it in any number of ways, some of which are emancipatory and some of which are just profoundly confusing. Um, when, 18, when, when Hayden, for example, said that you know, the era of art as the sort of expression of the absolute belongs to the past, you know, art is dead, some have said he, he coined that idea. At, around 1830, in his 1827 lectures, what he meant was, or at least what Adorno's reading of, of what he meant was that art's self-evidence had, had been lost. Art, from that point forward, was essentially a question about what the basis of art, artistic practice was. Whereas before it had been kind of like unquestioned, you know, just social practice where, I mean, really was just quibbling about details about like color schemes and the relationship, you know, how to represent certain biblical characters, etc. Now it became a question of what is art? You know, how, you know, and why, why does this have to be what art is? That, that was essentially the, the drama that unfolded for the next, you know, over a, around a century or so. Um, once we get to, to 1917, 1918, 1919, uh, you get a, a figure like Rochenko, a, a painter tra trained by Malevich, who ends a triptych in 1920, um, red, yellow, blue, by saying that, you know, I've reached the logical end of painting. From this point forward, you know, painting is over. I'm no, I'm not going to paint anymore. He, and he, what he, what he became, he became an ad man, L literally. With with Mayakovsky, one of the greatest poets of the era, they created advertisements for Soviet society. Obviously, like with commodification and this idea of consumerism, whatever, um, this would this would seem to run counter entirely to to what what people view as like the kind of like countercultural significance of you know rebelling against you know the society of advertisements and being inundated by things telling you to buy things but the, the the question of the ending of art and its sort of inundation of life i think is entirely dependent in that moment on the political and social context of the transformation that was taking place then. the question of what advertisements would be would there be advertisements in a post-capitalist society was something that they had to concretely address well, it, and the idea for, for Rochenko and Mayakovsky was that, you know, art, art is going to be collapsed into life. The point of art in the point of advertisements isn't to, to create on, isn't to create artificial needs or desires, but rather, or to, to create a sort of surplus, extract a sort of surplus value by creating demand, but it was rather to inform the, the public of useful new items for, their, their everyday consumption. After that point, though, I mean, there's the, the third, you know, major death of art narrative, end of art, it, Arthur Danto dates it to around 1968. And the question of what happens to the avant-garde after that point, or whether art ends, I think, is, is very different from what the avant-garde itself was proclaiming. The Dadaists said, you know, art is dead, art is dead, art is dead. Like, you know, we aren't creating art. We don't want to create art. Art needs to die. Um, it being viewed as a kind of like fulfillment rather than a kind of you know a, a tragic loss. Uh, I, I think that after 1968, there's there's just a sort of profound confusion about like you know where are we going? Like is everything art? Does anything art? You no. Know, can art end in any number of ways? Some of which are you know potentially liberating others of which are just a sort of burden on the unliberated consciousness of humanity. Um, and Richard, will that. Hey, first of all, I wanted to ask you, I think you're on the phone. He's fine. Okay, I wanted to ask you a question to follow up, because like when you spoke, like you spoke about this idea of heading towards a classless and post-racial society, mm -hmm. which actually is not my sense of the all. I mean, certainly not we're headed towards a classless society, 
And it's true that the discussion of race has changed, but I don't think we're that kind of post-racial. So that's one question, like whether you saw that as an actual possibility. And the other question, and how you saw that as fact, and the other question was when you talked about the internet. And then one of the things that I thought about in terms of the internet is that there is this temptation to represent, to create a kind of virtual museum, right? That you can, you can sort of, either now you could have like this simulation of a museum visit through the internet. And somehow I have a feeling that people will still want some kind of physical experience of a museum, even if only to say that they have been to a museum, then I don't somehow imagine that the virtualization of the museum experience really will take over, but I'm not sure. And I, I guess like the, the question relating to commodities, which is the question is like, if you abolish the commodification of art, aren't you really just creating a patronage relationship with artists? And if artists are gonna live by your art, and somebody's just paying them for their art, and that being the state of society, so in effect you're going back to a, a pre-modern or earlier patron relationship, except that the ideology of the patron is different, like the church or the aristocracy. But that's really, it seems to me, what you're talking about, sociology, those are two. Thanks, Yeah. Um, on the question of race, I think that there's a lot of people I mean to suggest it more in an ideological sense of what I feel like in terms of like common knowledge and acceptance is like promoting and what like the media is promoting in many ways is this notion of you know having a black president and being extremely politically correct and having all of the children's TV shows with multiracial casts. I think that we are very much promoting this idea of being able to get past these issues that yeah they're extremely deeply embedded and definitely have so much like institutional and structural work left to be done with them. Um, so I do apologize for any confusion on that. Um, but something that is coming up for me in terms if we're going to talk about commodification of art, um, is that I and I hope this is in response to your question a little bit. Um, I was in a panel earlier on indebtedness and in art. And I feel like we can't talk about art in 2013 without talking about debt. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I learned in the panel earlier was that like artists have the largest amount of debt, people who have been art students of any like other field. So, and then you brought up advertising. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> almost as important. But um, I brought up advertising, and for me, it's like in like think about who makes like every single advertising. Like I personally love Mad Men just because I love looking at that like history of like how we got here and it's so nuts and like if, like my question is like in what way did the advertising industry kind of rob us of artists? Because because of debt, we are like as artists are forced into the industrial and you know uh, corporate jobs and then not able to fulfill whatever other like destiny like or vision that our art could have possibly been constructed as and it's only like increasing so what we were discussing in the earlier panel was this idea that like art for many artists is becoming like actually the representation of navigating that debt because no matter what you're doing you're also balancing your basic like inherent need for survival and so i feel like if we're going to talk about like technology and like all of these things and the commodification of art, we also need to talk about like the role of like debt and like socioeconomic mobility like in the art world and more generally. Um, someone made a comment in the last panel I was at just saying like if you're car if you're working as a carpenter for ten hours, you're not gonna be able to read a book when you get home, you're just gonna be too tired. And it's like as much it's like how much can we like keep working, how much can we like saturate our days in order to be able to like fulfill like all the desires that we have as artists and to be able to fulfill our basic needs as people. Ben? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of points I wanted to respond to. I mean, just to start with the most recent thing you said, I mean, I think that there is a important uh, change that I suppose might be dated to the 60s, but perhaps oh. earlier, just, you know, the end of Bohemia. Right. I mean, we don't really have like Bohemian culture anymore, in which people are capable of like 
you know, I don't know, eating a ting. Walk up in the village? Well, that, yeah, that's a yeah. walk up in the village and like, you know, whatever, man, like, I don't have to like get a job because I'll just eat like, you know, a Campbell's soup can, you know, for dinner or whatever, because like, it is the case that, you know, in order to identify as an artist, like, you go to college for several years and then you become locked into some sort of, you know, uh, imperative to work. I mean, it's also perhaps m more deeper than that, in that um, the counterculture of the 60s, despite its like pretense to bohemianism, actually like merged pretty seamlessly with the dominant culture and lost its kind of like, you know, uh, pretense to being somehow in opposition uh, to that culture so that you do get like, you know, a kind of, I don't know, like convention of the aesthetics of the 60s is somehow like a permanent feature of our world, you know, urban outfitters and, and so on. Um, but I wanted to say some other things. I mean, there's, you know, your point about Benjamin and Krakauer being taught in, in the academy and being used in the academic conferences. I mean, one thing that strikes me about that, like the shorthand I would use, is just simply that it's always of note that it's Benjamin but not Adorno, and it's against Adorno. Like, people don't like Adorno, but they like Benjamin. Yet, Benjamin and Adorno were absolutely of a piece. Like, they had completely, you know, uh, agree you know they had letters of disagreement, but they were so much in agreement that one wouldn't make sense to try and distinguish their ideas, like they were intellectual collaborators. And so it's kind of interesting to note that the way that Adorno, or rather the way that Benjamin is used today is as some sort of legitimation of, you know, the kind of um, loss of critical standards, kind of to make reference to what Spencer is talking about in the face of the rise of mass culture. And Adorno is like, you know, maligned for somehow like apparently upholding like a kind of antiquated notion of like high culture as opposed to the mass culture. Whereas I don't think that Benjamin is either like, you know, the endorser of mass culture nor is Adorno the like, you know, despiser of mass culture. Like these terms in the actual writing and thinking of these figures are far more nuanced and subtle and, and you know, to use a word that's not, you know, often used in our context like dialectical. Um, you know, they were thinking through contradictions in the actual subjects at hand in dialectical ways. But, you know, I think that that's, you know, perhaps a way of, you know, getting beyond the kind of, like, unfortunate recycling of, like, Benjamin and, like, 101 cultural studies classes or something. And um, I also wanted to say something about the internet as, like, newness and, like, the question of technology. Because I think that one of the uh, tendencies that, you know, is prevalent today on not just the, you know, art world, but more broadly, is this notion that somehow like it's technology that moves society. Like it's the internet as an invention that then goes about like transforming society. So the internet, you know, is like whatever open source at the beginning and so therefore it means that it's like an instrument for the democratization of society. Whereas clearly like the, in the internet is just a way of like, you know, uh, our like acceptance of the collapse of society. I mean, it, like, to me, that's what the internet tends to be about more than anything. It's like, you know, how do I, like, not even bother to participate in civil society after work? I just go home and, like, go on Facebook or something. It's this, like, withdrawal mechanism, you know? And so it, I don't actually see it as, like, itself emancipatory or itself potentially, you know, providing, like, a progressive new development. I think the question is, you know, what is the technology to society? Not what is you know what I mean? Like, there's a way that you can reverse it. I mean, like, there are examples from, you know, the earlier period that we were talking about uh, previously, like, the photograph, where, like, the photograph, you know, was, a like, originally thought of as a study for the painting, right? Like, the photograph as any kind of independent object wouldn't have made sense past a certain point. So the technology was there, but the social kind of need for the photograph as an individual object that was going to play its own role in culture didn't come about until far after the photograph's invention. And so the question is, you know, why is it that the painting seems the most appropriate vehicle for the expression of the, you know, sub subjectivity of the artist, even though the photograph exists for a period of 40 years, and then after a certain point it appears that photograph or photography completely, you know, takes over from the painting as the dominant mode in which, like, people experience culture. So the, you know, I think that we have to try and think through the ways in which, you know, it's not technology driving things, but technology, like art, is somehow symptomatic of society in ways that you have to try and read, not just, like, directly, you know, it's like, well, what does it represent in a kind of, you know, uh, unresolved way, like, it's neither one thing nor the other, it can be both, even if in contradiction with each other, and so, like, how do you kind of deal with that? I mean, it's like, you know, there's a lot of internet artists today, like, I'm good friends with one of them, 
who has had a great deal of success, but it's funny how like the work that he does that's actually like internet based, it's like pretty damn boring. Like I don't know, he does a whole lot of Second Life. Who? John Rathman. Um, John Rathman, who was actually a member of Platypus at the very beginning, but went off to have a successful art career instead of like, getting weird <laughs> ideological squabbles on the left. But he, um, yeah, like he does, you know, these like Second Life, like Avatar based work, which is pretty banal. But then the work that people really like is when he takes images from Google Street View, prints them in large format, frames them, and hangs them in the gallery. <laughs> you know, and it's like, so clearly, like, we haven't, like, even internet artists, and his entire career is premise on the idea as an internet artist, still haven't like realized any brand new potential in that material. The question is why? You know, why is the internet, despite its newness, not actually generating a new experience of the art object, but somehow being, you know, reincorporated into established and existent uh, art experiences? I mean, I, I guess I'll say a few things. Um, in response to your question about why not look to open figures and talking about cultural issues or cultural slash political issues, um, I mean, you know, I've, I've studied a fair amount of stuff. I, I haven't certainly studied all of it, but um, out of all of the other uh, cultural critic encounters I've come across, I haven't really found thinkers that have um, affected my affected me in such a profound way as the, the Frankfurt School. Now that's not to say that the Frankfurt School is better than everyone else, but I think that history, um, that, that, that their moment has, that still registers with us in ways that um, we haven't really superseded. I think it's more of a historical problem than like saying, like, oh, well, no one's been able to live up to their mantle or something. I mean, I find Frederick Jameson, for instance, a very interesting cultural critic, but he bases almost all his methodology on the Frankfurt School. I mean, there's, you know, there's a few other people that I like, but most of them are, you know, influenced by the Frankfurt School. I mean, they were the pioneers, essentially, and really looking into how um, culture is an actual expression of uh, the infrastructure. I mean, that's a Benny Minion line. Like a, lot of, like, a lot of people will say, like, oh, well, you know, culture's a periphery matter because what we have to worry about is economic issues. That's the driving force of society. And so, you know, it's not epiphenomenal. They were one of some of the first uh, in people to have the profound insights of that. Well, actually, no, it's not that the superstructure is, um, you know, subservient to the, the infrastructure. It's actually an expression of it. I would, uh, just if I could add, I mean, like, yeah. I also think that, you know, one has to ask about why the Frankfurt schools have this kind of bizarre rebirth. Um, because 15 or 20 years ago, no one would be talking about the Frankfurt School at academic conferences. So they right. would be, they'd be talking right. about Baudrillard and Derrida right. and, right. and, and, and so forth and so yeah. on. And so I think mean, there's a double issue of you know, a classic Stalinist gesture of using Marxism to bury Marxism finally. Um, um, but also uh, a, a deep anxiety about the collapse of Marxism. Um, that, 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 that registers in this, you know, uh, frankly unserious, you know, Benjamin as somehow, you know, the Marxist rabbi kind of, that's oh, well, you can take Marxist theologian. Right. You know, uh, this is, un, you know, it, it, it's only sort of half serious in the hands of 99% of the people at these conferences right. we're talking about. But certainly they did flee from Benjamin's Bolshevism if they encounter right. it in, mm -hmm. in the world. Right. Um, so that, you know, I, I think that it, it really does point to this issue of, 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 of the way in which, because the Frankfurt School, was the standing indictment of the new left. Adorno, above all, was the indictment of the new left. Uh, he, was the, he was the figure that the new left utterly rejected. Uh, and it's not the new left. Well, I mean, to Hal Foster's anti-aesthetic book, he's emphatic to point out that it's an anti-Adorno book. Now, what does that mean? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, the post, there was quite a strong rejection. Um, I mean, you know, and one also interesting thing about the Frankfurt School is that uh, you know, the common misconception is that they, uh, Adorno was an elitist, he saw himself above all the, the, the crap that was produced in the market and the culture and stuff like that. Well, I mean, you know, as Ben Talker pointed out, it's not necessarily true. And I think one of the uh, insightful things, especially in our moment, when the left just seems completely 
collapsed and ineffective on any political front whatsoever is uh, that the Frankfurt School were reflecting on a failed revolution, right? They were asking why didn't why did uh, Europe follow, you know, why, why didn't Europe join hands with Russia and, and start an international revolution? So th they weren't saying, they weren't only just reflecting on that fact, but they also saw their thinking and the way that society conducted itself as symptomatic of a failure of emancipation. Right, maybe, and, maybe the interest theoretically now is in some ways, you know, we're going through a weird Weimarian, Weimar period in a way, in our, I mean, not the same. I say this as a historian not as an art historian, but as a general historian. But, you know, I just, uh, it, it strikes me just listening to you talk, as I go, I've gone to all these conferences, you know, SCMS, uh, MLA, et cetera, and it's been amusing to me to listen to this when I go, because it's, wait a minute, what the hell are they? They're all coming out with this. And, you know, now, just thinking about it, just, you know, like, what, what, kind, what you would say, the left collapsed, and, you know, that would, what kind of society we've been living in. We're not as bad as Germany in the 20s, obviously, but not that great in terms of other situations, culturally, in the past. Although I must admit, I do object a little bit to the question of the 60s, you know, the counterculture, but that's another debate. Well, all, all, the, all the conversation here, to me, has, has and I am a last art historian, um, <laughs> remember, yes. um, broad generaliz generalizations that someone made about the new left then being co-opted, blah, blah, blah. Of course that's true. But in all the, all, the, all these um, historical moments, there, there are layers or ribbons, I don't know how to describe it, and those generalizations don't hold across the board. And, uh, of course I'm not, I mean, yes, I'm making a and, generalization that's... And confuse us about how to think about history. I mean, generalizations are useful insofar as they're useful, and then they're you know, problematic where they, you know, elide things. Um, but, you know, I mean, what brought this home to me about, like, the 1960s in particular, I, I um, wrote a review for the Platypus Review many issues ago on, in 2008 on the uh, occasion of Art Forum's 40-year anniversary of 1968, and which was, was so self-evident that this issue, this is, you know, the premier art world publication. It's all the, you know, most important galleries pay the five, hundred dollars for their like full page ads and it's like the art magazine right of record or something um, and what the art forum you know commemorative issue did was essentially say like you know look at how great the world is subsequent to 1968 like we've gained all this advance in our philosophical thinking and it kind of like you know would it I mean it actually recalled Benjamin uh, it recalled two things for me and I use them as my kind of like introduction to the essay one being, you know, the figure from the 1960s, kind of representational figure, Daniel Cohn-Bendit, who said upon, you know, his, I don't think it was actually upon his election, but after having, you know, become a member of, I think, the Green Party in Germany, said, you know, we lost socially, we lost politically, and we won culturally, and I always say, thank God, right? So the idea is that the 1960s won cult the culture war, right? Even if the radicalism of it died, even if the, like, social consciousness of it died, the culture war at least was one, right? So we all are like, you know, into the same like look of, you know, the, our clothing, our music, our like television, whatever, right? And so that I had that in mind. And then I had Benjamin's like, you know, the, uh, pro, you know, the every, every article of culture is a record of the like, you know, savagery that went into its production, right? So that there's a way in which by him saying we won culturally, he's actually identifying as the victor of history after 1968 and identifying the 60s as the victors of his, like the 60s generation as the victors of history. And it's like, well, if that's true, like if we take him on his word for that, what does that actually mean in light of the like reality of the world that we live in? That's my point. I mean, of course, I understand that not every figure corresponds, and there are many paths not taken out of the 1960s that point towards like more emancipatory politics, more emancipatory social consciousness, more emancipatory culture. Um, but largely what won was the dominant ethos of the 60s, and it is still our kind of reigning order today in, in important ways. And so I kind of, you know, the broad strokes, I think, generally convey the picture of our times. I, I don't know. I mean, is it really the case that like the details so like distinguish the image? I don't know. Well, well, hold on. Let's, um, I want to well, say about the, the 20s that I wish we went to 
much more <laughs> interesting to live in Berlin. I'm sure, I'm sure the like sex, drugs, and rock and roll were better. Than <laughs> 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 we have to wrap up the discussion. Well, it, let me just say a final note that, that it's kind of responding to Ben's point without uh, dealing with the issues of generalizations or not. Oh, I'm going to just speak. Yeah, the one that you Sorry, the, uh, um, I, I think the one thing that I felt, I think, in my opening remarks that uh, Spencer, Richard, and Ben kind of didn't hinge their points on was the idea of art in crisis, society in crisis, capitalism in crisis. Now, when we talk about um, how all artwork is kind of tainted with the barbarism of the times, like one can't experience art artwork in, like, uh, in, in one can't experience artwork at the same time without experiencing the barbarity of the times that we live in. Now, one, the, the, one bourgeois society was on this ascending period, and Kant wrote his famous book, The Critique of Judgment, that really set the foundation for what aesthetics means. He was saying that, like, well, you know, when one has a profound aesthetic experience, what you're experiencing is your freedom. Now, when the Industrial Revolution rolled around, it was obvious that the society we lived in became a form of domination as much as it offered emancipatory possibilities. I think that what we should say about the experiencing of the commodity form when we experience art is that we are in some way having a profound sense of our own unfreedom. So in, in a way, Kant's dictum reverses itself after capitalism comes into crisis. And that's what means, and that's also when art becomes into crisis. Because if art, let's, let's, just, let's just conflate a few things and say that art offers aesthetic experience in, in a very intentional way. You know, some people say it doesn't. Art is not just for just aesthetic experience. But for our purposes, let's just say that art offers aesthetic experience. And there was a time where that some of the greatest thinkers and people would say, like, oh, these great artists are offering a, a, glee, a glimpse into what our own freedom is and what it could be. Well, you know, I think after that crisis, is we, we should say, like, well, the commodity, the commodity form that presents itself within the experience of art is a glimpse into our own freedom. But it, it's not, hopefully, it would, you know, you would say, like, well, maybe we should just become cynical and accept the fact that we're unfree. But it actually points to the conditions of possibility that capitalism offers, the investitory potential that within it. And I mean, I, I had bits in my presentation that was, was going to go into how, just because I say that art, like the logic of the commodity form, is inherent to the logic of art, I also wanted to talk about how art was kind of the, a very high expression of the contradictory elements of the commodity form. Uh, but, you know, we didn't really, we talked about a lot of other things which I thought was quite likely to enjoy. Well, there's much more to say, obviously. That, that's my conclusion. Chris, you should plug the reading. Yes, I'm a reading. Oh, and <laughs> we are having a summer reading group uh, in Platypus. It, uh, it's, I'm not clear if it's going to be held at SVA or the new school yet. SVA. Is it going to be SVA? SVA. It's SVA. It's school of Visual Arts. June 23rd, is it? Ben? What is what is SVA? It's School of Visual Arts. I, my apologies. We, we'll have the information on our website soon, um, but we'll be having a reading group in, in, uh, for a few weeks that deal with a lot of these topics. And it's not just about fun art. We're going to actually read a lot of the Frankfurt School and Trotsky's excellent book, uh, Parts from the Literature Revolution, that are actually uh, quite interrelated to the ideas expressed in the Frankfurt School. Um, so if you guys are interested in discussing these topics further, this, you know, historical specificity of art, commodity. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you all, I'll give you all, come Here, to do you guys want the address for the reading group where it's going to be held? Yeah. Will this be announced on the It will be announced on our list, but just so that people who are maybe not subscribed to the list. By the way, if you want to be on the list, you just go downstairs to our table. Ah, here. Uh, but it's 133 West 21st Street, fourth floor, room 402, and I believe it starts in three weeks. What day? Sundays. Oh, what time? Uh, it will be 2 to 5. Huh. I believe, unless it shouldn't two change. 2 to 5? 2 to 5. Sundays. All are welcome. And then here, here's my email, if you, because I, as, as of now, I'm going to be uh, facilitating the reading group. So if you have any questions, concerns, or criticisms, do it. Are you going to put the readings up there? Or in a oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It'll all be, it'll all be on, online on the website. We'll have PDFs cool. available for download. It'll be an open discussion. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you.